All right. So you will remember that uh, hot strip from the hot strip mill um, has some issues with uh, high temperature oxidation. So it's first stage of high temperature oxidation when we reheat the slab in the reheating furnace, you get relatively thick, so-called primary scale, that's removed by the uh, descaler. And uh, as you go through the line, the strip continues to be uh, exposed to uh, thermal oxidation. And, um, and also when it's coiled in uh, the, uh, as a strip. So, uh, uh, usually the material uh, must be uh, uh, the, the, the oxide uh, layer on the, on the strip must be removed and that's done by pickling, acid pickling. Um, so and, and in particular uh, if you're going to process the, the material by uh, cold rolling it's, it's got to uh, happen uh, before the cold rolling. So, uh, so we'll be talking about uh, the main uh, process parameters and um, some designs of, of pickling lines uh, and, and what's important for the removal of the, the oxides. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we'll also discuss uh, the situation with the, the pickling solution uh, 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 composition. Uh, as well as the regeneration of this uh, solution. And we'll, we'll discuss some uh, problems or abnormalities such as pitting and copper plating uh, will be discussed. All right, so if you um, uh, take a, um, uh, a piece of uh, steel, ferritic steel, an, an, an IF steel, which stands for interstitial free steel, which is pretty much um, almost pure uh, ferrite. Um, if you uh, keep it uh, for 30 minutes at uh, 1100 degrees C and you look at the cross section of this, um, uh, of the sur what's on the surface, you see an oxide layer. Hmm? Uh, that can be a, a few micro uh, hundreds of microns thick, hmm? two, three hundred microns uh, of oxide. Um, so the uh, it's a complex oxide. You have uh, Fe2O3 or hematite at the very surface, then a layer of uh, magnetite, and then a layer of um, woodstite. Hmm? Um, woodstite itself um, is uh, present at temperatures above 570. Below this temperature, the, the woodstite isn't really thermodynamically stable. So if you look at the microstructure at the room temperature, which, which you see is actually rather complex uh, woodstite layer that contains a lot of uh, magnetite also. So the idea is you have to remove this and um, uh, the, the removal rate of this oxide by pickling will, is different for the uh, different uh, these different oxides. In particular, uh, hematite is a very hard and compact oxide that's difficult to remove during the, the pickling. Uh, Wustite is uh, porous and it's easy to remove and magnetite is somewhere in between. So the, the big problem is in, in when it comes to uh, uh, removing the oxides is the this hematite layer. So you want it to be as thin as possible, yes, and so uh, this will uh, be the case if you have lower coiling temperatures, yes, uh, and uh, higher cooling rates, hmm? so that you, you don't form uh, much of this, uh, this hematite layer. The, um, if you um, uh, look at the strip, yes, as, um, as it is uncoiled, so you have the strip is, is coiled, right? You get lots of oxidation of the coiled strip because the, the oxygen can penetrate into the, uh, uh, the, 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 the windings of the coil. Um, and you look at the surface, you see, uh, well, first of all, it's again a brownish black, yes? 
And, and you also see uh, that uh, very often there is like a wavy line at the edge here. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically what, what you're looking at, uh, these, these different hues, uh, colors, in, are, are related to the oxygen and how far, or the oxygen potential, mm -hmm. how far the oxygen uh, has been able to, to penetrate inside the windings. Um, one of these wavy uh, uh, oxide patterns come from the fact that you, um, it, it's due to the profile of the strip. Your, your strip profile, you remember the, the thickness, and this again is very exaggerated, looks like this in cross-section. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason why your strip has this shape is because the edges get rolled a little bit harder, more, than the, uh, than the, uh, the central part. So if I uh, would uh, take this strip now and I would uh, cut it in, in narrower strips, I would find that uh, these strips, when I laid, I put them parallel to one another, yes? They're actually not the same length anymore, yes? But uh, at the edge, they're longer than in the middle. Again, this is uh, much exaggerated. Uh, but if you ever visit a slitting line, uh, so where, we, where a strip is actually cut in narrow uh, strips, you will see that, uh, uh, and remember that a coil a cold roll coil can easily be uh, more than a kilometer long, yes? Uh, these these uh, small uh, plastic differences in plastic strains are very, very visible in, different, in length differences. But it also means that when you coil a material, yes, the edge being slightly larger than the, the center, there is a slight wave. of the strip. You cannot see it. You don't, you know, if, you, if you visit a, a plant, you will not see the, the strip will be this wavy. This very, very subtle uh, wave. But it's, it's large enough to give you a wavy appearance of the, uh, this, this oxide thickness as you go, as when you unroll the strip. Hmm? Very slight differences in, in thicknesses uh, over the uh, width of the strip. Hmm? And so there are um, differences in the, uh, in, 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 the, in the strip oxidation. And so let's, let's say uh, some general things about this, uh, about the, the, the oxide layer. So if we unroll, we take a hot roll band now, uh, that's, co that's cooled and uh, to room temperature, and we uncoil it. Yeah? So if we, we, we take this thing that's about 500 meters long, yes, and we uncoil it, yes, uh, and, and so we look at the top surface, yes, and this would be the head end, yes, and this is the, the tail end, yes, yes. And uh, I look at the, the top surface, hmm? what I see is that um, the scale thickness at the, at the edge yes, is, is higher than in the middle, obviously, because in the middle the oxygen has to, uh, uh, the air has to penetrate a longer distance to, to do the oxides, right? So I get a gradual decrease in the, uh, the thickness of the oxide towards the, the center of the strip. Uh, there is another thing that is uh, uh, happening is that the uh, stresses, yes, the stresses and strains in the coil strip are different. Uh, when, you, um, when you make a coil, yes, uh, you can see here that on the interior side, yes, the strip will be in compression at the surface, yes? compression. Whereas on the exterior side, there'll be a, t a tension. Yes, yes. Uh, and of course at the uh, outer side you'll get the same. Mm -hmm. On this side 
it's in compression, here it's in tension. Yeah? So uh, on this side, my strip, the, will, the oxide, uh, can be fractured, right? Can be fractured. On the inner side, there may be cracks, but it will the the the, the, the cracks will not be opened. Yes, and, uh, and and of course because of the radius, hmm? the, uh, uh, the 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 the, st the strains hmm? are are more important in the uh, uh, in the center. Hmm? So so if I look at the top surface, yeah, that's the interior part of the of the strip. I get high compressive strains at what used to be the head end, because the head of the, the strip is now at the center of your coil, yes? and the tail end has lower compressive strains at the top surface. And of course, if you look at the other side of the strip, it's reversed. Hmm? You get high tensile uh, strains where you had high compressive strains uh, at the top surface. Hmm? Okay, and then you have this, you can have this uh, um, uh, um, these stresses, uh, as I said. So the, the scale is, uh, the tenacious scale, the, the thick scale is formed in the condition of uh, high uh, or intermediate oxygen potential and cooling rate. Hmm? Hmm? And so tensile strains, yes, and uh, uh, or compressive strains are good because they crack the oxide and as such they permit the passage of the, uh, the pickling solution uh, underneath the, the oxide to, to remove it. Okay? So, uh, so what you have when you open, you unfold the, the strip, you see uh, these lines, these wavy lines. Hmm? That are uh, that basically give me a, a slightly thicker edge scale hmm, because the oxygen uh, can penetrate uh, different uh, distances due to the the wavy edge of the uh, rolled strip, but you can also have uh, very uh, locally uh, thicker uh, oxides, yeah, which are, for instance, uh, uh, and we call this burned-in scale. That's basically because the strip is slightly damaged there and, and, and it, it gets to be more oxidized. Hmm? All right, so how do we remove this, uh, this oxide? Well, very simply, we, we just put it in a, in a, a solution of uh, hydrochloric acid. Hmm? So we have a puckling solution on uh, one uh, side and we have our base metal that's covered with, uh, with oxide. And, and most of it, most of it is Fe three or four magnetite because the, the hematite you remember is a thinner layer at the top. Then you have uh, magnetite, and then the the wustite is you know, transforms mainly to magnetite. So so we can consider this to be magnetite. So um, and and so what what's the reaction? Well, it's hydrochloric acid with magnetite goes into uh, making uh, iron uh, chloride and uh, oxygen here. There can be uh, reactions also uh, with, the, um, with, with the base metal itself. So the, the, your strip cannot, has to stay in the solution for a controlled amount of time, right? Because you don't want uh, to uh, uh, dis be uh, dissolving your uh, your steel. Hmm? Okay. Right. The other thing that happens, of course, is that um, the uh, uh, close to the oxide, I a, the, the hydrochloric acid is being used up. Yes. So if I look at the the profile of the hydrochloric acid content close to the uh, the scale layer, the content will be lower hmm? because it's being used up in the pickling uh, reaction. So um, this boundary layer has to be made as thin as possible. Yeah? That's why these, uh, these pickling uh, bats are very turbulent. Yes? You, 
There's lots of turbulence in these baths and uh, movement of the uh, pickling solution so that uh, uh, there is very efficient transfer of the uh, hydrochloric acid towards the oxide. Hmm? And so, um, so you want to make this, this boundary layer as thin as possible. Yes. So if I were to use a static bath, yes, a static bath, the, so, uh, uh, yes, the, uh, the boundary layer thickness would increase, yes? And so it's not so if I use a, a, a shallow bath that uh, flows over or encounter, you, you'll see in a moment how these baths look like, in, in the direction, counter to the direction in which the strip moves, hmm? yes? And um, you can get an even lower boundary layer by having, use, using uh, uh, high turbulence uh, baths by using jets, yes? Hmm? You can see here that the boundary layer is very small. So the effectiveness of the pickling depends very much on the, on the turbulence of, of the bath. Uh, and, and the reason why that's the case is because you, you reduce the boundary layer. Mm -hmm. So a, um, a pickling line will look like this. You, you, you will decoil the material, yes? And, and then you, go, uh, you don't go straight into these, uh, the pickling tanks, yes? But you go into a piece of equipment that we'll uh, see more often as we go is a tension leveler, yes? And a tension leveler, um, uh, very often after the rolling, your strip um, is not really flat, yes? And in order to make it flat, you, you pass it through a tension leveler. Hmm? We'll see in, in later on how the uh, tension leveler works, but you basically make sure that the, the strip is flat so you can feed it nicely into the, uh, the pickling uh, line. The, uh, uh, the tension leveling, yes, the, the flattening of the coil, is, is basically a, uh, a roller system, yes, when you, where you bend the strip back and forth, like this. Yes? When you do this, yes, um, you uh, deform the surface plastically and you crack the oxide layer. So the, 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 the leveler has uh, two uh, uh, functions, is it breaks the scale and it, it also levels or, 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 or uh, makes sure you have a flat strip that is easy to, uh, to uh, pull through the line. Now, why would you want to have a flat strip? Because, uh, uh, well, f first of all, it's, it's good for the stability of your process, yes? But uh, the other reason is that you want to be able to weld it to the strip that goes into the pickling line, yes? So, uh, pickling lines are, uh, in the steel industry, certainly when it comes to strip material, continuous operations. So you do one strip after the other, and you pull the, the strip through the lines uh, by welding them uh, to each other. Hmm? So the process section of a pickling line consists of uh, relatively shallow tanks uh, where, you, where the... Um, uh, the solution cascades through the, um, through the units from one tank to the other, yes? And you have a spray, uh, and there is a, a rinse section at the, at the end of the, of the process uh, section. Uh, pickling lines may also include side trimming and skin pass. What is side trimming um, and skin pass? When a hot rolled product is the final product. So it, when it, that's the product that's gonna be shipped out uh, to, for instance, a, a truck maker that's going to use it to uh, make a, uh, a frame for a truck, yes? Um, the, the, the strip gets, um, gets th there's no more th uh, metallurgical work being done on, on, the, on the strip. So, um, so what you do, you will uh, uh, make sure that the length is correct and that uh, and uh, nice and nice and straight. So you uh, the, 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 and what you do is you get rid of what's called the edge drop. 
uh, we'll, we'll talk about what that is, but at the very edge of the strip, there is some uh, rolling, um, some kind of instability, which uh, it makes it the, the strip edge is uh, it's very difficult to control the thickness. So sometimes uh, you can get rid of it uh, after the pickling. Um, so that's what this, um, this side trimming is all about. The skin pass is basically a way to ensure that the material, the uh, material, doesn't have a, uh, a, a luders bands. You know, you probably remember what luders bands are: localized deformation, localized deformation at, uh, when you yield, when the material yields. Um, uh, many people who do uh, forming operations don't like that, and so uh, skin pass gets rid of it. Yes. Okay. So th these are uh, extra units. So uh, let's have a look at the inside of these uh, baths. So what, what, again, what you have is a, um, a pickling line uh, has a cascade system. So if you look at the the uh, acid concentration. Hmm, the acid concentration is um, gradually, it moves in different, uh, because the, the strip and the uh, acid move in different directions, yes? You uh, basically don't expose the strip to the fresh acid at the very beginning. Hmm? So what, this is uh, how it works. Uh, perhaps this, this, uh, uh, figure will, will uh, uh, show you how uh, it works. So the, the strip goes into tanks, yes, one to the other, yeah. and you introduce the fresh acid here, yes? And the, fr the, the acid um, uh, moves from this bath to this bath, yes? Okay, and it gets recovered. So they move in counter uh, in counter direction. So the strip is not directly exposed to the highest uh, uh, concentration of, of acid. Yes. Why would you do this? Well, well, because if you would put the highest concentration of acid here, then uh, it would move this way. So it's, it's really the best way. Uh, and also this way you make sure that when you remove the acid, you, it's run out of acidity. It's, yeah, the pH is, um, is uh, not as efficient anymore. Okay? And the, the tanks can be uh, shallow tanks or can actually be uh, in jet pickling units. Uh, it looks like you, you have these rolls, which we call squeegee rolls, yes, which uh, close off the different... Uh, uh, sections, so you, they're not uh, actual um, baths anymore, hmm? and you have lots of turbulence here to uh, limit the um, the thickness of the the boundary layer. Okay, so you have basically ba two basic types of pickling lines. You have the, what's called the continuous pickling line. So in this case, we have coils that are uh, brought uh, together at the uh, decoiler. So the coiling, the un you go into the decoiler, the leveling, you pass a welding post where you weld the start of this coil to the uh, tail of the previous coil, yes? And then you go into what's called an accumulator. What is an accumulator? Well. What is very important here in this continuous process is that the strip velocity is always the same. You don't want to have the strip stopping in the acid bath. You don't want to do this because if you stay too long in the acid, you start to dissolve steel, right? So you don't want to do this. The acid, okay? So the strip moves at a constant speed through this pickling line. But what is happening here? When you're joining, when you're joining, the strip has to st stop moving. So it's, yeah, and you have to make the weld. So in order to uh, 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 avoid the changes in 
line speed here, you have accumulators. Yes? The accumulators, you basically accumulate length of strip. Yes? And um, when this stands still, these rolls move to the right yes, so that you continue feeding strip with the same uh, strip velocity through the, the pickling line, hmm? uh, although the end here is standing still. Uh, there are many other advantages to accumulators. If you have a technical problem, you can still continue production yes, uh, for maybe a minute uh, before having to take more radical uh, actions. And then you have an exit uh, accumulator also, skin pass mill, and then you, you coil uh, the, the coils one after the other. Uh, you also have pickling lines which are called push-pull pickling lines. In that case, yes, um, you do one coil at a time, yes, yes, uh, and that is specifically for steel grades that are very difficult to weld, yes, uh, and and then these uh, types of uh, materials are pickled individually, yeah? so you have to have a special um, line basically. That, that you, where you pull the, every single strip, the starting part of the strip through the line. Hmm? Okay. Um, the, um, what, what would be typical uh, grades that are difficult to weld? Well, this is the grades that contain higher levels of alloying in amounts, in particular silicon. Yeah? So, so higher silicon steels and I'm talking about a few percents of silicon, like, like uh, 3%, uh, are very difficult to weld. You can weld them, but the weld may break, yes, or not hold very well, and uh, so that's the kind of a problem you cannot live with. So then you, 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 you will use a push-pull pickling line. Right, so um, when the strip enters, it's literally covered with... Uh, this brown reddish oxide yeah? so that you can really see it it's very clear and uh, it may even be a little bit uh, wobbly yes when it comes out the surface absolutely perfect okay it's fully uh, uh, defect free there's no oxides uh, there's always inspection at the end of the the pickling line you can see here this is the surface and, and this is a big mirror where its surface is uh, uh, mirrored on, so you, the inspector can see both top and bottom surface of the, uh, the strip, um, either visually by standing there or via a camera. Uh, all right. Nowadays, uh, there is a trend, certainly for... Um, uh, high quality uh, strip products uh, is to combine the pickling and the cold rolling at the same time. Uh, this has an advantage because um, you don't need to coil and decoil the material between the pickling and the cold rolling. That's a big investment uh, cost reduction. Um, so what basically looks like, you have uh, decoilers, decoilers or what we, we call them payoff reels, uh, 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 with, with decoilers it's very important to know whether it's a, what we call a payoff reel or a, a, a tension uh, uh, reel, right? It's, the, the, the coiler can just be something you, that pulls off the, where you can roll off the, uh, the strip, but it can also have tension, right? So it, you get back tension. In, uh, when you do uh, a rolling, it's very important when, because you want to have tension on the strip, uh, be able to have tension on the strip uh, as uh, we have uh, discussed. So anyway, you... Um, you, un you uh, decoil, you go to a looper, uh, 
a looper is, um, I don't like the word very much, but anyway, that's accumulator. Yeah? So a be better word is to use accumulator. Uh, because looper is, is actually used to uh, describe the tension control system that you have between two stands of a um, hot uh, strip mill uh, finishing um, mill. So um, tension, leveler, uh, pickling tank, and then you go delivery loop or, off or delivery accumulator, and then you go directly into the cold mill. Right? All right. That is uh, the trends. In um, the uh, pickling, there are a number of uh, aspects which are related to uh, surface qualities. Uh, you want to avoid uh, pits, yes? The, the pits are uh, mainly uh, there are, of course, forms to, during pickling, but they're basically acid attack uh, with the strip, yes? Something you, uh, you, you basically want to avoid, yes? Uh, there is another thing that's really important, that's what we call copper plating, yes? And then you have burned-in scales. And burned-in scales is basically uh, due to um, fault, no, uh, un, uh, imperfect removal of, of oxides, yeah? At, um, usually um, due to poor scale cracking. Hmm? And it can be eliminated by having tension levelers. Um, yeah. But usually the burned in scales is because you have too thick an oxide layer and um, so there, um, you have to uh, avoid to, to get that. But the copper plating is an interesting uh, situation. Um, what happens is um, you know that steels always contain some level of copper as an alloying element, yes? Um, and um, that in, uh, in, in many cases when, you're, uh, when you use uh, electric arc furnace steels, yes? Uh, there will be a relatively high uh, copper content in your steel. And as a consequence, uh, there will be a copper in your solution, yes? Mm -hmm. And um, if in an acid, yes, an acid, uh, low pH, you have contact uh, between your solution, uh, acidic solution, which contains copper and in contact with iron, because the copper is more noble, it will form copper metal, yes? and an iron will go into solution. Yeah? So that's not so good, yes? And the reason why it's not so good is because you don't want copper at the surface of your strip and, and you don't want pits in your steel. Yeah? So coppering, yes, uh, uh, is, is due to the fact that as you uh, process uh, your, your, uh, your steels, yes, the copper concentration will gradually increase, and it can be uh, uh, increased to a level that's dangerous for this to occur. If you use uh, EAF uh, scrap selection that is relatively poor and, and that allows uh, high levels of copper in your steel, yes? Um, so what do we do to avoid this? Hmm? Um, well, first of all, we need to make sure that uh, the, uh, we, in, in solution, we have f uh, ferry, uh, ferric ions rather than uh, Fe3 plus ions rather than Fe2 plus ions. And uh, we should also make sure that we have a... Um, a low pH, hmm? lower pH. So, so let me uh, explain to you what, uh, what these two graphs show. This is the, the copper concentration in your solution. Hmm? And here you have the content of uh, uh, Fe3 in the solution. So Fe3 is oxidizing. Hmm? 
And so it will, it, it's, it's, uh, uh, this um, copper deposition is less likely to happen if your solution is, oxid is acidic and oxidizing. So, um, so you can see that, uh, and the, uh, the orange regions here are regions of where coppering can occur. Obviously, if I have lots of copper in my solution, uh, if, if I have lots of copper in my solution, I will get the risk for having coppering is very high. However, if my, uh, so if I have, for instance, 200 ppm of uh, copper, the, uh, if I have a high content of Fe3 plus ions in my solution, I can reduce the risk of copper deposition. Yes. I can also reduce the uh, risk of copper deposition by making sure that my solution is acidic and that's reducing the pH. And you see that if I reduce the pH by increasing the uh, concentration of uh, hydrochloric acid from 40 grams per liter to 60 grams per liter, I reduce the, 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 the region over which uh, coppering occurs. Uh, also, um, if I say, uh, let's look now at a... Um, constant uh, 100 grams per liter of acid in my pickling solution and say I have a 1 grams per liter of Fe3 plus, it's important to reduce the amount of Fe2 plus in solution, right? If in, in this condition I will have, I can uh, reduce the, I can, I can make the, the coppering absent when having this line move to here, and this is done by going from the white points to the uh, yellow points, and the, uh, so by reducing, and this corresponds to reduction in the Fe2 plus concentration. Hmm? Now, this needs to be corrected in your, uh, in your notes. The yellow and the green have to be corrected, because you want you want to have low Fe2 plus content uh, to uh, suppress copper, okay? So you basically saying that uh, you, you want your solution, your pickling solution to be oxidizing, so containing Fe3 plus rather than Fe2 plus, and acidic, have a high level of, um, of uh, a higher level of uh, acid. Hmm? The, um, the, the pickling uh, unit comes with a little factory that uh, produces uh, iron oxide and regenerates the uh, acid, the hydrochloric acid. Hmm? So this is this, this little regeneration plant uh, for the recovery of the acid, yes. So the acid gets regenerated, yes. You don't have to uh, dump it, yes. And uh, so here, here you have the uh, the uh, uh, pickling line, and here you have the regeneration line. I'm not going to go into detail of how this generation regeneration is done, but you basically use a process that's called pyrohydrolysis, yes. And it basically means that you expose the solution yes, uh, that contains now iron chloride in, 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 uh, in, uh, that's dissolved in water. You expose it to a mixture of steam and oxygen. Yes? So it's at high temperatures. And when you do this, you recover the uh, hydrochloric acid and you make hematite. And uh, it doesn't matter whether it's, it's so because the iron can be iron two plus or iron three plus. Hmm? Uh, if uh, the iron three plus also is, it goes into the uh, uh, the production of uh, this hematite, hmm? and that is a very um, uh, useful byproduct of the pickling line. Yes. 
So you regenerate your, your uh, hydrochloric acid and you, and you obtain these powders or granules depending on the, the process you use to regenerate uh, uh, the acid. Hmm? And these, these powders are basically Fe2O3. Yes? The, uh, this is, a, is a, an actual product because this, there's a lot of use for these, uh, this, F, this, uh, this hematite in uh, production of ferrites or in the, the pigment industry, for instance, or paints. Yes? So this is uh, actually a source of income for uh, steel industry. So we, we've talked what were the essentials of uh, the hot strip pickling. Yes? It's always carried out, yes, uh, definitely uh, before uh, cold rolling. And, and we've seen what's important is that you have these, uh, this high turbulence. Uh, make sure that you only pickle off, take off the, the oxides, and that you don't create uh, surface defects, such as coppering and pits in the process of uh, removing the, the oxide. Hmm? And it's very essential that uh, the strip quality is, is, is very high after this, uh, this pickling hmm? um, to prepare it for uh, either uh, shipping or, or production of cold strip um, later at a, a later step. So let us uh, have a look at the uh, later step and the later the step that follows the pickling of uh, is of course and is called rolling. Mm -hmm. oh, that's odd. Should be here. Okay, cold strip melt. And so we'll um, introduce that subject now for coming 15 minutes. So we'll be, we'll be talking about uh, the cold rolling and we'll also mention uh, the uh, processes that are associated with it very closely. Uh, that is the annealing and the temper rolling. Yes. So what do we uh, produce in a cold st uh, strip mill? Well, a, a strip. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we need strip with specific uh, format, dimensions. Yeah? And in particular, the, the, the thickness uh, targets have to be met. And we need to have an acceptable shape. The strip has to be an, in an acceptable, uh, ha have an acceptable um, profile. Mm -hmm. So um, after this uh, cold strip mill, the uh, material is, in contrast to the hot uh, strip mill, the material cannot really be used because uh, it's, it's heavily cold deformed. And so it has, it's, it's very, very hard and, uh, and it has no plasticity. So you need to uh, recrystallization, anneal it. Hmm? Uh, and that can be done by batch annealing, so in, st in, in uh, individual steps, um, coil by coil, as it were, or continuously annealed. Hmm? You can also uh, apply, and that's very important, coatings on your strip. Yeah? That can be, these coatings can be uh, electro-galvanized, coatings or hot dip galvanized. And then the strip is also um, temporal usually. And there is very often a surface treatment uh, at the very end of that. Mm -hmm. And in specific cases, the strip can also be uh, coated with uh, organic coatings or paint layers. And we'll discuss that in separate uh, 
lectures on coated products. Right, so I'll be talking about the essentials of uh, cold rolling and uh, the design of cold, cold mills and what the relation is between the processing and the uh, um, materials properties you want to achieve. Hmm? All right, so the cold rolling, the material that goes into continuous annealing or batch annealing. Alternatively, it can also go to, and it very often does, certainly for strip materials, into hot dip galvanizing or electro galvanizing. And, and you basically, what we end up with is, is this product here, which is a cold roll coil. Hmm? Uh, cold rolling mills are uh, there are different uh, versions, we'll talk about this, but one of the very mo most common ones you will encounter is, is basically a tandem cold mill. So that tandem because you have a number of stands, uh, one after the other, positioned one after the other, yes? Uh, and there is a, a decoiler and a coiler, at, at, a, a decoiler at the beginning or and a coiler at the end. Hmm? Um, and as I said, uh, in recent times, uh, very often the uh, cold uh, tandem mill is in operation together with a pickling line. Yes. So then the strip doesn't come from a coil, but comes straight out of the exit accumulator of the pickling line. Hmm? All right, so this typical layout uh, that you have yeah, of a modern uh, line. You have one, two, three, four, five. And if you look at it, this is a six high. There's six rolls, uh, uh, six high stands. Yeah. And you have two, and this is important, um, oops, uh, tension, excuse me, tension reels, so that means that uh, you can apply a tension force on the strip as it gets rolled. Hmm? And you know that this can be beneficial because you can uh, reduce the rolling force when you apply tension. Hmm? The, um, uh, the exit uh, tension reels, um, usually we have two because you need uh, basic, uh, the operation you try to have is, is constant uh, high productivity, excuse me. So you will have um, one coiler, uh, one uh, coil that is, uh, when it's um, coiled, it will, you need some time to take it off and uh, remove it. Uh, put it away. Then the the coil that's av um, the coiler that's available can already start uh, processing, coiling the the, the next uh, strip. Hmm? Uh, there is a shear here uh, of the material, yes, at the end to make sure you have a straight line. This is also if you're ever you know working with the industry, and you know you uh, you want to have samples. This is a place where you, there's always samples available uh, from uh, uh, production uh, material. Mm -hmm. Although not so useful as uh, head and tail pieces of bar uh, because it's much thinner, mm -hmm. much shorter. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can have uh, this situation where you have uh, two uh, 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 Exit tension reels, this, this was also one where you have two e exit tension. Or you can have a, another uh, system where you have uh, one motor with a gear unit, yes, and then a, uh, two reels, yes, one, uh, uh, so you have uh, this mandrel here, Yes, uh, two, two positions where you can uh, reel, yeah, reel the, the strip. This mandrel here uh, is 
uh, where you put the, the, the rolled strip and you remove it, while at the same time you're uh, rolling, coiling the next strip. And so they, they switch position. When this, this coil is all coiled up, it goes to this position. This mandrel is now ready to, to coil, and, and this uh, mandrel is offloaded. Okay, now uh, very many smaller companies, yes, do not, or and uh, not always smaller companies, or stainless steel companies do not have uh, these uh, tandem mills. Yes, they will have reversing mills. Yes, and for instance, um, a and, and single stand mill. So in this case, for instance, um, this is a layout. We have a, I have a single stand here, yes, and it's a six high. Mm -hmm. um, this uh, design here has a a payoff reel, yes. So I basically uncoil here, um, roll it once, yes, roll it once, and remove it, right. So I. This, obviously, this system uh, is very limited in what you can do. You cannot uh, give huge amounts of reductions, yes? Um, and if you want to uh, uh, roll it again, you have to take this coil, yes? Move it over here and pass it through the line again, right? Okay. But obviously, because this is a simple payoff reel, and this is a simple one direction uh, mill stand, uh, your investments will be limited. So if you ever want to start a small um, steel company in your garage, this is <laughs> what you would start with. Hmm? Um, obviously, um, one of the things uh, you you'd want to do with, if you only have a single mill, yes, is well, maybe I can, you can use it to go back and forth, and then you have what's called a uh, reversing mill. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is also a design here where you have six high stand, so six rolls here, mm -hmm. uh, and you have, but in this case, because you're rolling in two directions, you need to pull in both directions. So you have two tension reels. Yes. And, and the strip passes back and forth, yes? Obviously, uh, when you think about it, uh, things are a little bit more complicated in, in this case. And um, when you do the uh, cold reduction in multiple passes, yes, um, there are some things you need to take into account. So, so how, how does it work? Yeah? First, first thing you do is you have to put the coil into the system, into the, into the mill, right? So um, it's, it's, it starts here, right? So you're unrolling the hot rolled coil. Mm -hmm. So you do this in a payoff reel. Mm -hmm. The payoff reel has no tension, and you put it over the, it passes through the, 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 the mill, and you uh, put it on this tension Real. Yeah? So you start making a coil on this side. Hmm? That's the first pass. Hmm? Now, uh, obviously, there will be an end piece to this, right? That's not held on to it, doesn't hold on to anything, right? So you have a strip press here that makes sure that there is some tension on the strip, yes? So that the coiling on this side is, is nice and tight, okay? Okay? Then, uh, so the this, strip this press provides tension by friction. So this end then goes on this mandrel, and that's the that's a tension reel now. Yes? So you put it on this one, right? And so now you can start the second pass, yes, and go back in this direction because this now you have a tension reel on this side. So if you have 
an uh, even number of passes through the uh, uh, mill, the coil will now be on the uh, entry side again. Yes? Hmm? Okay. If I have an odd number of passes, yes, the coil will be on this side. Right? So there's a little bit of thinking to do when you organize the production, you know, because where, you know, where is the coil going to be end up uh, as, as you do the production? Hmm? Okay, so uh, say, uh, so, so if, if say it's on this side, yes, uh, then I cut, I cut here, I shear off the, the strip, yes, and I have my coil is ready to go, okay? And I'm left, oh, I'm left with this little piece of material here, yes? Why would I be left with this piece of you remember that as you go through the line, uh, the, the strip, I'm always pulling at the end. But because I'm pulling at the end, I'm also not letting the strip, that piece I'm pulling on, through the, the mill. So that end doesn't get rolled, right? So you have a piece of material that never goes into the, yes, into the, um, into the mill, right? So this, this, and this, that's why you left, you, you don't use this, right? Because it's totally off dimensions, right? This will be one millimeter of thickness, and, and here you have something that's still as thick as the original hot strip, yes? All right? Okay, so, um, uh, right, so this is, if it's odd, odd number of passes, for instance, I, uh, I, I do the shear cut here, and I remove the product coil, yes? And then I'm left on this side with what is called a PUP coil, P-U-P coil. Hmm? So uh, usually um, this, this is how it works. You, you, you do an odd number of passes. Hmm? And again, important is that inside here, this red section here, right? Yes, that n never got rolled reversibly, right? So there the, it's off gauge, it's off thickness, yes? And then you're left with this uh, pup coil uh, at, at the end, hmm? and that's also off gauge, yeah? So pup, this is a pup, a little dog, and this is a pup coil, right? Off gauge uh, piece of, and there is, of course, a market for this because it's perfectly good material, yes? It's been pickled and uh, hot rolled, yes. So, um, but it's got, um, yeah, and, and it's, um, because it didn't get uh, rolled really much, yes, it's, uh, you could, it's also formable, right? Okay. And perhaps this is a sweet picture to stop with for today. Okay. We'll continue, uh, I guess, on Monday. Thank you very much.